My name is Michael. Thank you for being here. I'll be presenting uniform distributions on the integers. Feel free to interrupt me with any questions, but please leave all, sorry, clarifying questions, but please leave all other comments and questions to the end. Thank you. Okay, so today we are going to be discussing random integers. For example, what is the probability that a random integer is a multiple of three? By the end of this talk, I hope you will be able to answer that question, and moreover, that you'll be able to rigorously defend your answer. So, in order to derive the probability that a random integer is a multiple of three, we are going to have to make some assumptions. Namely, we are going to assume that each integer is equally likely. Or in other words, that the integers are distributed uniformly. And we're going to assume that because it's, at least at a high level, an easy to grasp concept, and one that would be a natural starting point for discussing randomness. And it's parsimonious in the sense that it treats every integer the same. And finally, it is a fairly common assumption for the priors of a Bayesian model. Okay, so the standard approach, so we want a uniform distribution. The standard approach to defining any distribution is via a probability measure. So let me remind you what a probability measure is. It's a function p from the power set of the integers into the reals that's between 0 and 1, and it maps the entire space of integers to 1. And moreover, it obeys countable additivity. That is, if we consider a countable collection of events, and they're disjoint, and we take their union, the probability of that union is the sum of the probabilities of the individual events in that collection. Unfortunately, such a probability measure cannot approximate uniformity. It can come nowhere close, so if we consider any probability measure, we can always, and we choose some portion of the mass of this probability measure, anything less than one, then we can always find a finite set to which it assigns that mass to that set. So it's going to place an arbitrarily high amount of mass on a finite set. So in some sense, the infinite points complement to this finite set are going to be uh, disproportionately underweighted. So the infinite points outside of the set are going to be neglected. So that's clearly not what we want from uniformity. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to weaken the countable additivity axiom. So we're going to start with a function p that's between 0 and 1 as before, but now, now we say, okay, if you have a finite collection of disjoint events and you take their union, you can calculate the probability of that union as the sum, but now our sum only has to be finite. So this does not necessarily hold if our collection is infinite. So this is a weaker condition. And in fact, this is going to allow us to define uniform distributions. And now I'm just going to show what the integer, the point, what each integer has to have as its probability, if it's uniform, under a finally additive probability. So each point, let's say, has probability c, then we so I'm going to show that c greater than 0 implies a contradiction. So just consider a set with greater than 1 over c points. By finite additivity, we can just sum over those points to calculate the probability of the set. So each of these points, so each of, so this probability of each point is just going to be, by construction c, there's greater than 1 over c points. So this sum is going to be greater than 1. And that's a contradiction of normalization. So a constant must be 0. So now we know every point has to have probability 0. So this, this is going to imply by finite additivity that every finite set has probability 0. And that, and that is going to imply by finite additivity that every cofinite set has probability 1. 
And that leaves undetermined, undetermined infinite sets whose complements are also infinite. And it turns out that there are many ways of specifying probabilities on infinite sets whose complements are also infinite. And so we're going to consider families of uniform distributions. And of course, that's in contrast to the finite or bounded case where we would just take one over the number of points for each, the probability for each point. OK, so I'm going to consider three families from the literature, the limit frequency family, the shift invariance family, and the residue class family. And each of these families corresponds to some intuitive notion of uniformity. And so let's start with the limit frequency family. OK, so the limit frequency family says we should be able to recover our notion of uniformity on infinite sets by considering uniformity on bounded intervals. So let un denote the uniform distribution on negative n to n. Then the probability of a set A under un is just the cardinality, which I denote with absolute value sign, of it intersecting with the interval. So that's the proportion of the interval in A divided by the number of points. And so limit frequency says we're going to take the limit of this as n goes to infinity. If that limit exists, we call it the limit frequency of the set. And then we define the family L, the limit frequency family, to be the set of uniform distributions that assign the probability of an event to its limit frequency for all sets which have limit frequencies. And then we can extend this. Well, this is all uniform distributions that satisfy that property. Uh, not all sets have limit frequencies, but this family is, in fact, not empty. In fact, it is infinite. So let's consider an example. Random multiples of b, which I denote as bz. So the first line is just, oops. Yeah. Okay. So the first line is just the definition. And then, so if we intersect, let's say, uh, 1 to n with the interval, uh, sorry, with the multiples of b, we get n over, floor of n over b points. And if we intersect negative n to negative 1, we also get floor n over, n over b points. And then we get an additional point for 0. So that, that gives us the second line, the numerator of the second line. And then the third line, I just pair additive constants and constant factors that have no asymptotic effect. Then in the next line, so here, the second to last line, I write out the floor division in terms of the non-floor division and the fractional part. And the fractional part, of course, is dominated by 1 over n, so we just get 1 over b. So the multiples of b, it's every b point, as one would expect, the probability is 1 over b. Okay, so let's consider another family, the shift invariant family. Okay, so if every integer is the same, then in some sense, if the relative locations remain the same, then the probability of the event should be the same. So more precisely, if we just shift a set, the probability of the shifted set should be the same as the probability of the unshifted set. So a shift is just, a, we just add an integer to the set, to all points in the set should not affect the probability. And this is an infinite family, just as the limit frequency family is. So let's revisit our example. Now to calculate the probability of the multiples of b for a, from a, pop, for a probability from the shift invariant family, we're going to consider multiples with, of b with a shift, k. And these are called residue classes. You may have also seen the notation k mod b for these objects. Now, by shift invariance, the probability of these residue classes is independent of the shift. All right, and if we sum over them from shift 0 to b minus 1 for a residue class mod b, all of these residue classes are going to be disjoint. So by finite additivity, we can calculate this sum as the union of these residue classes. And the union of these residue classes is the entire set of integers, which is, of course, 1. Now, each of these terms 
has to be equal. So in particular, uh, well, each of the, there's B terms, so each term has to be 1 over B, in particular, the probability of the multiples of B. And so that agrees with what we had for the limit frequency family. For the residue class family, we're just going to start with these residue classes and say any residue class mod B has probability 1 over B. And this is another infinite family of uniform distributions. And of course, just by definition, for our example, the probability of a multiples of B is 1 over B. And more generally, straightforward extensions of the proofs I've given show that the, all three of these families agree on all residue classes. Moreover, these families are nested, so the limit frequency family corresponds to the strongest notion of uniformity. It's the least inclusive family, so any uniform distribution in the limit frequency family is also in the shift invariant family. It's also in the residue class family. And so, yeah, each of these families corresponds to an intuitive notion of uniformity, so the interpretation of this nesting of these families is that one gets progressively weaker notions of uniformity as one moves from the limit frequency to the shift invariant to the residue class family. Okay, so in this next section, I'm going to consider weak notions of uniformity. So before we saw the weakest notion was the residue class, and why do we care about these weak notions of uniformity? Well, suppose we only needed to calculate the probabilities of residue classes, then we wouldn't need to define a limit frequency of a set. It's much simpler to just use the residue class family. We don't need this extra machinery. So in that sense, it's more parsimonious and it's more interpretable. And even if we needed a stronger notion of uniformity to attain uniqueness, for example, we needed to consider all sets with limit frequencies, then we could still hope to decompose what is meant by limit frequency by looking at weaker notions of uniformity. Or in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to consider the question, can we recover the definition of the residue class family from a weaker condition. Namely, if we just consider a subset of residue classes and we define the uniform distributions on that for that that obey the residue class condition on those residue class condi uh, residue classes. Do we really need all the residue classes to get off? If we do that, do, do our extent does the extension of our family does it does it have unique values on the rest of the residue classes we didn't define it on? That's the question. And do, would it agree with the residue class family? So, I, I don't think I did a good job explaining that, but here I'm going to make it more precise. Uh, so, let me remind you what the residue class family is. It just assigns every residue class mod B the probability of 1 over B. And so we're going to consider the particular question, so we're going to define this new family, the prime residue class family. We're just going to say that the residue class is mod P for prime P get probability 1 over P, and then we're going to ask, does this prime residue class family equal the residue class family? So we know the residue class family is contained in the prime residue class family, because every uniform distribution that obeys the residue class condition will also obey the prime residue class condition. But we don't necessarily know they're equal. We might think that they're equal because every integer has a prime factorization. But what I'm going to show is that, no, the residue class family is strictly contained in the prime residue class family. And I'm going to do that by exhibiting an element Q that's in the prime residue class family, but not the residue class family. So let's define this Q. So we're going to define it in terms of a an element from the residue class family, little r, this little r, and we know, we know this uh, residue class family is not empty, so we can find a little r, and the choice is immaterial to the analysis, so just choose any one. And then we're going to define the odds to be zo, I denote the odds by zo, and now we're going to define the probability of an event under q as the probability of 
the event intersected with the odds under R plus two times the probability of the event intersected with the multiples of four under R. And the interpretation of this definition is that we are assigning normal weight relative to R to A, to the portion of A in the odds. And we're assigning double weight to the portion of A in the multiples of four. And we're assigning no weight to the portion of A in the multiples of four with shift two. So the multiples of four and the multiples of four with shift two and the odds are a partition of the integers. Okay, so, so we want to show that Q is in PR and that Q is not in R. So we're just going to start by showing that it's not in P, that, that it is in PR. So we have to show that it's a uniform distribution and that it obeys the prime residue class property. So let's start by showing it's a uniform distribution. We're going to divide that into it satisfies uniformity and that it's a finitely additive probability. Okay, so to show that it's a uniform distribution, we simply plug in a point. Sorry, not a uniform distribution. This is the first step to showing that it's a uniform distribution, that it satisfies uniformity, that is, it assigns the probability to a point zero. That's uniformity. Then we need to check that it's finitely additive probability. So if we plug in a point, then when we intersect it with a set, we either get that point back or we get the empty set. Now, the empty set will be mapped to zero because little r is a finitely additive probability, and it's going to map the point to zero because it's a uniform distribution. So remember, R itself is a uniform distribution. So when we sum up, we get a zero in whatever case you consider. Okay, so now let's just check that it's a finitely additive probability. So the non-negativity of Q follows by non-negativity of R. That's straightforward. Normalization, let's plug in the set of integers. Now, when we intersect the integers with the odds, we of course get the odds back. And when we intersect the integers with the multiples of four, we get the multiples of four back. And then we just apply the definition of R. So R is the residue class family. The odds are a mod two residue class. So they receive probability one half. The multiples of four are a residue class mod four. They receive probability one fourth. You add it up, you get one. Finite additivity, consider two disjoint subsets. Take their union. Now, we're going to get, so we get this union intersected with the odds. We also get a union intersected with the multiples of four. We're going to distribute the intersection into the union. So we're going to get a union of intersections. This union of intersection, intersect, sorry. Yeah, this union of intersection is going to be empty because A and B are disjoint. Sorry, not empty. They're, okay, so this, we distribute the, inter, the intersection. We get a union of intersections. This new union is going to be disjoint just uh, because A and B are disjoint. Uh, does everyone understand that? That's kind of, kind of fumbled with the explanation. So we're going to get the odds intersected with A union B intersected with the odds. So we know A and B are disjoint union by assumption. And it's the same is going to be true when we consider this new union with A intersected the odds, B intersected the odds. It's also going to be a disjoint union. And similarly, we're going to have A intersected multiples of four is going to be a disjoint union with B intersected the multiples of four. And then we're going to then we're going to apply finite, sorry, we're going to apply, yeah, finite additivity of little r. So then we get, from this term, we get these two terms. For, from the first term, under the, the first line under finite additivity, we get the first and second term in the next line by finite additivity. And similarly here, the second term turns into the third and fourth term. Okay, and now we're going to combine the first and third term and we get Q of A by definition. This is this definition of Q of A. And similarly, if we combine the second and fourth term, we get Q of B, just by definition. Okay, so now we know Q is a uniform distribution. 
we saw that it satisfied uniformity and that it was a finally additive probability. So now we know that it is a uniform distribution. So to show that it's in the prime residue class family, we simply need to check that it satisfies the prime residue class condition. So we just check the probability that a residue class mod p is 1 over p. We're going to break it into two cases. The p, the prime p is 2, or the prime p is greater than 2. Okay, so the case that prime is 2, let's just plug in a residue class mod 2, and show that a equals 1 half. That's 1 over p, where p equals 2. That's what we want. So when we do that, we're going to break it up into two cases, depending on whether the shift is odd or even. So the parity of the shift. If the shift is odd, then we just get the odds. So we intersect it with the odds, we get the odds back. We intersect it with the multiples of 4, we get the empty set. When we sum that up, we just get 1 half. And if, we, and if the shift is even, then we get the even numbers. And we, when we intersect it with the odds, that's empty. And when intersecting with the multiples of 4, that's the multiples of 4. And then we again get 1 half. OK, so now let's consider the prime greater than 2. We're going to symbolically plug in a resident class mod p. And what we want to notice here is now we have an intersection of a resident class mod p with a residue class mod 2, so the odds are a mod 2 residue class. Now p and 2 are co-prime because p is a prime greater than 2. So co-prime just means that they have no common prime factors. And similarly, we have the next term, uh, we have a residue class mod p intersected with a residue class mod 4. p and 4 are co-prime. Why that matters is we can apply the Chinese remainder theorem. So the Chinese remainder theorem states that if you have two co-prime integers, then if you take a residue class mod one of those integers, you intersect it with a residue class mod the other, you get a new residue class mod their product, the product of those two co-prime integers. Remember, co-prime means that they have no common prime factor. So, we're just going to apply the Chinese remainder theorem to each of the intersections we have. So we have these, at the top, we have these two intersections. We apply the Chinese remainder theorem and we get a new residue class mod 2p and a new residue class mod 4p. So it's the product of p and 2 in the first case. So that in the first, in the, at the top, we had a p and a, a mod 2. So we get 2p down here. And similarly, we get a residue class mod 4p in the other intersection. 4 times p are two co-prime integers. And that's their product as, and we can do this by the Chinese remainder theorem. And then we just apply the, the definition of r, and we sum up, and we get 1 over p. That's what we want. So now we know we consider the two cases p greater, so yeah, p equals 2 and p greater than 2. Now we know that their probability is 1 over p for residue classes mod p, and we knew it was a uniform distribution. Therefore, we can conclude that this is q is in the prime residue class found. Uh, now we're going to show that it's not in the residue class family. As I alluded to when we constructed this q, sorry, when we defined this q, it assigns no weight to the portion of an event in the multiples of 4 with shift 2. So we just plug in the multiples of 4 with shift 2, we get 0. But if it were in the residue class family, it would have to have probability 1 4. Because of course, this residue class has is a modulus 4. So it's not in the residue class family. So that completes our proof. We know that what we started with, that is the residue class family is contained in the prime residue class family. Now we have an element Q that's in the prime residue class family, not in the residue class family. So now we can finally conclude that the residue class family is strictly contained in the prime residue class family. So I'm going to summarize. We started wanting uniform distributions, but we could not use probability measure. 
probability measure was too strong, that the chemical additivity axiom was too strong, we weakened that axiom with finite additivity. So we, we saw the problem of existence, but then our families were not unique. So there existed families. In fact, infinite families, I considered three from the literature, the limit frequency family, the shift invariant family, and the residue class family. And then I introduced this prime residue class family, and they have this nesting property that the limit frequency family corresponds to the strongest notion of uniformity, followed by shift invariance, residue class, and prime residue class. And the prime, the prime residue class family is distinctive and has the weakest notion of uniformity, and that could have applications to, to decomposing what we mean by uniformity. It also has special number of theoretic properties. So we saw that it was the only family that did not, that was not uniquely defined by residue classes. And another result, which I did not cover here, is that it may assign positive probability to the set of problems. So I hope you have gained some intuition about uniform distributions on the integers. You now know how to think about that. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, uh, well, at first, I guess I want to say that it was kind of refreshingly short and simple and snappy, and you know, you have one lesson to take away, which is not always the case you know, uh -huh. in, in these talks. Um, so, I guess, like, is there an application for this? So, well, the application that I presented is, is just an idea of how would you think about uniformity on unbounded sets. How could you even start to do it? Right. There could be applications. Um, I alluded to special number theoretic properties. So there could possibly, this could be a, possibly be a fruitful perspective from which to study number theory applications, which could have applications to cryptography. Um, it could have at least theoretical applications to uh, decision theory or game theory. Um, if you wanted your decision maker to be able to uniformly randomize among uh, undivided set, then you would need this. And, and then it also has applications to foundations. So I alluded to uh, uninformative priors for a Bayesian model. You can, one way of implementing that is to use a uniform distribution. And so this says, how do you give that a probabilistic interpretation? So instead of well, you, you can call that an improper prior, but then it doesn't have a probabilistic interpretation. This gives it a probabilistic interpretation for your prior. If you want a prior that's uniform on, on an unbounded set. So if you have, a, like a, if you have an infinite collection of right. parameters and you want them all to be equally likely, how do you interpret that? Okay. So, um, there are, um, I don't, I don't, I've never seen this kind of notion of probability before. But in number theory, generally they talk about uh, probabilistic notions of things like what is the probability that two natural numbers drawn at random are co prime? That's like 6 by pi squared or something. Mm -hmm. And then what's the probability that a random number that you draw up to in the range 0 to n is prime? Mm -hmm. That's like 1 by log n. Mm -hmm. And so, how do they? I mean, what kind of notion of probability are they they're, using when they... They're essentially using the limit frequency notion of probability. So, yeah, they're just taking limits. So like you said, they could consider just 0 to n, and that would just be essentially the un. So number theoreticians do this automatically, but they do it with limit frequency, and you're considering other notions. Of... Right, and they, they're... They're not concerned with actually formally defining the probability. So, really, if they're if if they call it probability, it's really just li limit frequency. So this says, how do you actually get a probabilistic notions from axioms? Right. Okay. Any other questions? Seems like limit frequency is like the most. Intuitive out of that. I think so. Yeah. <laughs>
Yeah, I guess so. Okay, thank you. Yeah.